Welcome back to Psychedelics Today. This is Joe Moore coming at you from Breckenridge, Colorado. Today on the show, we feature James Orock. James is the author of Tryptamine Palace and a new book titled The New Psychedelic Revolution, which um, I think most of you will find more interesting than the uh, the Pollen book. The Pollen book was great. This one's just... Uh, you know, maybe what you should read first before reading that one. So I think you're going to love this interview. We go all over the map. We talk about Burning Man, visionary art, um, politics, drug war, um, politics around the 5-MeO DMT experience, and much more. We kind of uh, do a tour de force here. So I think you're going to dig it. Let us know what you think. Psychedelics today, email at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. And just a few quick words before we get spinning with the interview. If you want to support the show, please leave us a review on Facebook or iTunes. Um, there's plenty of you out there that listen to the show that haven't done it yet. And it would make a big difference to us if you did. So please, please, please do that. And tell your friends too. If you would like to deepen your psychedelic education from home you can join us. Uh, we've got a great class going called Navigating Psychedelics. We cover tons of subject areas from drug testing to uh, general safety, prepping for the psychedelic experience, doing the psychedelic experience, um, post-care on the psychedelic experience, and much more. We, we really uh, go all over the map and try to get you everything you need to to feel safer in this uh, beginning phase or even if you're somebody who's been around psychedelics for a long time this is probably something that would uh just you know fill in any gaps you might have on your psychedelic knowledge set we've also filled in uh the class with tons of <clears throat> master classes from experts in different sub areas of psychedelia uh for instance we've got uh larry norris phd from Erie, uh, our integration group out of the Bay Area, Elizabeth Gibson and Lenny Gibson, our breathwork teachers. We've also got Shannon Carlin. Um, she works with uh, MAPS and uh, has been with them for a long time. She was great talking about integration and finding a therapist. And Catherine McLean contributed, Ashley Booth from the Integration Pro or sorry, Awareness Project and Interspace Integration in Los Angeles, Mitch Gomez from Dance Safe, Julie Megler. MSN, a nurse practitioner from Erie as well, out in San Francisco, Richard Grossman, who's a, a PhD acupuncturist, been doing ayahuasca facilitation for a long time, Vilmarie Narlock from Dan uh, sorry, SSDP, Students for Sensible Drug Policy, talking about identifying emergencies and opiate safety and identifying emergencies with MDMA and other stimulants and set and setting there. Uh, we get uh, Michelle Hobart, MS. Uh, talking about spiritual emergence, which was great. Ingmar Gorman, talking about integration therapy and clinical assessment, and more. So that's a, just a sample of what we have in the masterclass section beyond what we've developed as what we thought um, was essential 101 education. So check that out, psychedelicstoday.teachable.com. You can also find it from psychedelicstoday.com. Again, if you have any questions or want to hit us up, psychedelicstoday, email at gmail.com. Take care, everybody. Enjoy the episode. Bye-bye. Today on the show, we have James Orock. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So you've written a few uh, books on psychedelics and have kind of accidentally, I guess, in a way, become a expert and kind of psychedelic icon in a lot of ways. Um, oh, thank you very much. <laughs> so, appreciate that. Yeah, no worries. So you've, yeah, you kind of did, were doing a no noveling, extreme sports journalism, and, and anything else uh, before you kind of stumbled into psychedelic writing? Uh, no, I mean, I've, I have a long history of being a, an extreme sports journalist and a, and a, and a friction, fiction writer. I've always enjoyed writing. Um, and yeah, I was actually, I am actually still halfway through a novel that I've been writing for years that I, I decided to stop working on and um, write Tryptamine Palace, my first book on 5-methoxy-DMT, um, 
at when I was working pretty hard on the novel at that point. And I remember at the time it seemed like a terrible idea because here there was a book, I was going to write a book on psychedelics that nobody was publishing books on psychedelics at that point. And it was about a psychedelic that no one had ever heard about. And it was mostly about mysticism, which nobody was really seemed to be that interested in either. So it seemed like a very bad idea at the time. Um, and I was, but I was kind of overwhelmed by the amount of information that I was gathering and I, writing it down was the easiest way for me to keep track of it. So that sort of led into the book. And then I was lucky I was a very big into Burning Man in those days. I'm still somewhat into Burning Man, but I would say that was at the peak of my Burning, my burning Man artist uh, experience. And I decided I would write a book for Burning Man. So I actually did that and gave 500 copies away over a couple of years at Burning Man. And I believe it's the only book that's ever been written for Burning Man. And then it, it actually got itself off the plier and published all around the world. So it's been quite an amazing ride in itself. And then, yeah, my new book is after ten, more than 10 years of being sort of in the center of the psychedelic world because of the first book, it gave me the opportunity to take a broader look at psychedelic, contemporary psychedelic culture. Mm. Um, you know, since Tryptamine Palace came out, 5 methoxy DMT is a lot better known now. So it seems like times are catching up with me. Absolutely, in a lot of ways. And um, I think important to note, too, is that you're a world-class paragliding competitor. Um, yeah, back in, back in the air a lot these days. <laughs> so how, when did you start that? 90s, 80s? 80s. 80s yeah, I've been, nice. flying, I've been flying since the beginning, pretty yeah. much. That's awesome. Yeah, I was a mountaineer f for a long time, too, and I backcountry ski and all that kind of stuff. I actually think, and I've been thinking about this quite a bit recently, I actually think it gives me a different perspective on psychedelics to a lot of my contemporaries, especially because the first 10 years of my psychedelic use were more used in the mountains than they ever were to go out partying or anything like that. I'd say for the first decade at least, the majority of my psychedelic experiences were outside and in nature and being used in sort of a, a, a psychotic kind of way in some ways. Mm. Yeah, that's huge. I, I think that's actually really interesting. It's kind of the Hoffman style, always in nature. Um, and not too many folks are doing it consistently that way. They're, they are out there, people doing mushrooms in the woods pretty regularly, but I don't think it's the dominant method or type of experience. It actually was in the late 80s, because by the late 80s, psychedelic culture had pretty much collapsed. And the last real nodes of it were mostly in the mountains or in San Francisco. But places like Telluride or Boulder or places like that were actually where a lot of the psychedelic community had ended up. And, you know, in the late 80s, if you did, if you smoked weed or you did psychedelics, you're a loser. Nobody wanted anything to do with you. And if you were a ski bum, you were a loser. You know, now it's actually trendy to go to the mountains and and do a winter and all these other things. But back then it was actually not, it was not, you were, you were outside of the mainstream at that point. So I was lucky that I landed in the mountains and, and got access to psychedelic community through that experience, I think. Right. I agree. I, I'm actually living in Breckenridge, Colorado in the middle of the Rockies and um, yeah. was hanging out in Aspen maybe two, three months ago and ran into an old, somehow wealthy deadhead. I don't. I didn't ask him how, uh, but he uh, used to ski with tons of mescaline in him, which was fascinating. Mm. Everybody else was skiing on acid, he said, but he just preferred mescaline. I was like, that's a fascinating and uh, horrifying thing. Well, in, in the in in the eighties, you know, every town had its deadhead house full of of tally mark skiing deadheads, mostly <laughs> with dreads and everything else. I mean, that's a cliche, but they were there. And that's where you went if you wanted to score some good weed or some good owl, you know. And that was that was the network that was in place. And uh, I lived in Jackson Hole for two, 12 years, and it was pretty um, pretty normal behavior to, you know, head, head out on a powder day or if you're going for a two-day climb to take acid for the approach. Um, in my new book, there's an article I wrote for MAPS on 
on um, psychedelics and extreme sports that goes into that quite a lot. It's been seized on by the microdosing movement, but I don't think they entirely get what I'm saying because to me it was above the, above the microdose, below the psychedelic dose. There's a zone in there that you can work in quite effectively if you know it well enough. Um, and that was the zone that, you know, I spent a lot of time investigating. And that sort of leads you to the higher dosages. You know, it was the Hoffman model, but it's also really the shamanic model in the sense that traditionally most people have learned about psychedelics alone in a cave or outside, or, you know, they've had a more of a, a, a direct line to nature as opposed to most people these days find out about in a nightclub with flashing lights or at a festival or, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. That's far more common. And, um, I remember watching rock climbing documentaries where the dudes would often just be up all night raging and then sprint off to El Cap and solo El Cap. Well, wildly yeah. high on acid and loved it. Only a it few was, of them uh, died. Very few. Yeah. It was, it was pretty common in the seventies, I think. Hmm. Hang glider pilots and Telluride. I mean, all all kinds. Can you speak about? Um, so you've identified kind of publicly as um, mystic. Can you speak to um, this audience? I kind of tried to lay it out for you earlier to like what that means to you. Well, even with my early, I would say my early experimentations in nature took me to a agnostic viewpoint where I felt very connected but I didn't really think there was anything beyond that connection. Um, 5-methoxy-DMT converted me from being a, a scientific rationalist atheist to a, a person who believed he'd actually not only come in touch with the Godhead, but actually merged into it and become one with it in what's really the classical mystical experience. <coughs> so that was, I mean, that was in one 40 minute experience, my entire paradigm shifted entirely. And I spent the next five years trying to figure out how that was even possible. Right. And interesting that that's not the only, that story sounds very common for folks in the psychedelic world. It's like, oh, I was just digging through stuff. I thought it was interesting conceptually. And then all of a sudden, I had to figure shit out for the next bunch of years. And it was tough. Yeah. I mean, I think you see a few of us have gone. Jeremy Narby's book, The Cosmic Serpent, seems like Jeremy and I went through very similar experiences in very different ways. We sort of get knocked out of our, our rationalist boxes, but we're still rationalist enough that we want to make sense of it. Some people can just roll with it, accept that. Uh, I wasn't one of those people. There was also ex also almost zero information on 5-methoxy-DMT when, when that happened to me. And when I wrote Tryptamine Palace, I really didn't know if it would resonate with anybody at all. I was like, well, this was my experience. What's every, what does everybody else get? And it was very much designed, you know, like if, to be given away at Burning Man if you had just smoked 5-MeO and walked out of some dome and had, your whole world was turned upside down. And then synchronistically you bumped into me and I gave you my book. And I was like, well, I can't tell you what happened, but I can tell you what happened to me. You know, and it actually worked that way. It's surprising how many people did bump into me that, or got handed handed it from somebody else. Or, and I get letters from people who've come home from Peru and all kinds of places who are going through similar experiences after long dietas or whatever, and that's the same response I get is that the book's a good lifeline to sort of pull you into a place to comprehend a little bit more what happened to you. So I'm very grateful for that. What year did Tryptamine Palace come out? Like, did it coincide with the scheduling of 5-MeO at all? It came out about six months earlier, I think. 2000, and actually might have even been scheduled by the time it came out. It finally came out, the public version, in 2009. The when I gave the version away at Burning Man, it hadn't been scheduled, but I think it was already on its way. Mm, right, but, you know, you probably fed, you know, some fuel to the flame to like keep that underground going a little bit. No. Yeah. You know, I had some concern at the time about publishing the book for exactly that reason. And I know there was a, you know, in, in my book, I talk about this secret West coast society of five MEO users that I wanted to find and that I never could. And they were there. It was Ralph Metzner and his whole crew. 
and they had deliberately been keeping it quiet, I think, for that reason. Um, by the time my book got close enough to publication, it was already obvious that scheduling was happening. So the general the general opinion at the time was it was all right for me to release it. I've heard Ralph Metz is a bit annoyed about it, but I don't, he's never told me that. Um, yeah, you know, and the scheduling came about just with the general interest in research chemicals and all the other things that were going around. It wasn't a particularly against 5-MeO. They just stumbled into 5-MeO with all, all the other research chemicals at the same time. Right, right, right. Um, so your book, I had the chance to read the intro. Um, I think I read, uh, the first chapter and I jumped into your, the five MEO chapter, which was a talk you gave at, um, symbiosis. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. 2009. Cool stuff. I, I didn't get a chance to listen or read it all, but, um, I definitely will. It's, um, as you have said online a number of times, far more engaging than Michael Pollan's book. And, <laughs> you know, I, Totally agree with that. Like, you know, his book is okay. It did what it's supposed to do, but it's not that fascinating for folks that have been in the world for a while. It's very well written. It's decently researched. I find it interesting as a writer that there's a couple of places where he pursues his own narrative, even if he knows, even though he knows it's not true. An interesting point being his, he's very interested in Al Hubbard. Fair enough. Al Hubbard's a fascinating character. If you read his book, you think that Al Hubbard's the one that gave Tim Leary LSD. He didn't. LSD was given to Tim Leary by a guy called Michael Michael Hollingsworth, an Englishman who came to America with a gram of LSD and a jar of mayonnaise and went around giving it to everybody he could. He Now, he, now Poland leaves that entirely out of the book just because it didn't really fit into his narrative, which as a, you know, as a a non-fiction author, I find a little surprising. I know how that works, but but it's just interesting to see a writer of his caliber uh, even molding the story to his own narrative. I do find it amusing that we have guys step into the scene and immediately they become some kind of a spokesperson for the rest of us. I mean, Michael Coll- Michael um, Pollan's done psychedelics four times that he, he talks about. And the one mystically experience he has is when he finally goes for a walk in his garden. To me, he's like, to me, it's like the most neophyte introduction, but I also don't think he likes psychedelic culture at all. And he's very much, he likes this idea that psychedelics are going to cure people of depression and everything else. To me, depression's a natural result of the paradigm we're in. And it's sad that millions of people are suffering from it. The only way you're ever going to really cure it is by changing our society, not by you – know, I don't like the idea of psychedelics being used as Band-Aids to help people accept the current paradigm. I like the idea of psychedelics being dynamite to help bring the next paradigm shift. So I hear what you're saying. It – like right off the cuff, it sounds anti-medical, but it do- it isn't anti-medical. It's not like you're saying people shouldn't get treatment for being depressed, but it's a ban. We should understand that it's a band aid that allows you to go back into your culture, and you're probably going to need that same band aid again in a you know three, six, nine months. And the only way to really cure it is community and getting engaged and stuff, and you know really digging in. What what would you add to that? Well, smart people are depressed because they realize we're screwing this planet up and we may not have that much longer on it. I call it extinction denial in my first book. And since 2009, it's only got exponentially worse. Why do you think people are denying this extinction narrative? Well, because they want to get on with their lives. They don't feel there's anything they can do about it. You know, most people are just trying to worrying about their mortgage and worrying about where they're going to get the next meal and everything else. And if they get a little bit above that, then they want to, they get caught up in all the, the nice things that are offered to us. You know, there's this, this, I mean, the planet seriously messed up and it's gotten only more messed up in the last few years. So it doesn't surprise me. People are depressed. You know, I think writing is one of the things that stops me from being too depressed. Right. Yeah. It's, you know, you really have to get your thoughts on paper. If 
if you don't, you're not doing it right. Right. So you have to like, you know, really engage with what you think is the truth and, and dig deep. Well, all the things that psychedelics are being used for as medicines and are, are not, not true diseases, the diseases of the mind and psychedelics is not a true medicine. They're like a, you know, the reason why psychedelics didn't take hold as medicines in the sixties was they were found out to be too difficult to use. That they don't really work like normal medicines, so they're very difficult to fit within the medical model. And they're going to keep finding that problem again and again. So, yeah, sure, they can help people see things afresh. I just don't know if that's... The problem with medicalization is it puts it in one box and it, it leaves out a lot of other possibilities for psychedelics. I'm way more interested in giving psychedelics to healthy people, personally. So you don't think... Um the medical model will change to accommodate the crazy stuff that happens in psychedelic states? It's going to be a different, it has to be a completely different kind of model, really, I think, for it to be in a... They don't fall under the true classification of medicines. Yeah, I don't like the word. I prefer calling them drugs. Yeah, I, they're almost, I prefer calling them therapy to be honest, because they're more closer to therapy than they are something that's going to cure a cold or, you know, drugs are, drugs are useful because they attack certain root problems in the body and they, you know, they're easy to understand. Psychedelics don't work that way. Psychedelics attack something very different. And I, I think there's, I can see why people are interested in using them. As medicines, I just don't think that should be the focus of psychedelic culture. And that's what's happening is there's a real pull at the moment towards this idea that psychedelics are going to get legal and they're going to get prescribed. And to me, that's not the model I'm interested in. So the guys over at Drug Policy Alliance, I think it was Jack Davis or Davies maybe, he kind of convinced me that medicalization doesn't mean rescheduling there is a good chance that even if we get it medicalized, that the reschedule, the schedule will still stay the same and the yeah, penalties exactly. will still be high. So it's, it's, you know, even though the, the language of the scheduling is such that no medical use it doesn't mean that they're going to fold and, and put us in jail less often. So somehow more people were arrested for cannabis last year than any other year. Outrageous. I think even in California, right? Like, yeah, somebody explain, somebody explain that to me. It's nuts. So the guy, uh, Brian Normand Viveros, who runs uh, Symposia, has told me a few times. Uh, we've had a long conversation about: Is it really legal? Is cannabis really legal? If you can only have six plants, like that doesn't make any sense. That's not that's not legalization. That's like heightened regulation in a lot of ways. And it's only legal in certain parts of this country. I live in the deep south. It's still throwing black kids in jail for years for a couple of joints. I misread an article yesterday about Oregon. Uh, legalizing. So it said New Oregon laws. It was a decriminalization. I read it as New Orleans decriminalization. I was like, oh yeah, great. I'm going more often. But uh, I read it very wrong. Um, and I know people get in big trouble in the, um, down there. They did They did actually somewhat decriminalize it within the city of New Orleans. Mm. So if you get busted for a couple of joints now, they will most likely just give you a ticket. But I wouldn't necessarily guarantee that if you were a black kid in the in the neighborhoods, yeah, as opposed exactly. to a white as opposed to a white tourist French quarter, <laughs> right, right, um, for sure. I mean, and the disparity I mean, the is main, incredible there. Well, that's the main reason they don't want to get rid of it here in the South, is it's their main tool for racial racial profiling. Mm. You know, it, it is the gateway drug to prison. Ugh. If you look at the if you look at the majority of young black youths in the South. Their first arrest was weed. Often, when they were teenagers and they get stuck in a half, you know, they get stuck in some kind of a criminal training school, as I call them. Right. Now I know once, how to deal meth and make crazy money. Well, once you've been arrested once, you're like you're on the way out. You know, you know, it's it's just a vicious, vicious downward slide, and it all starts with a weed bust. So that would be a good place to to start. You know, changing things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for those listening in the South, you know, reach out if you want to get involved. I, I would love to help facilitate that. Some good news out of New York is that Brooklyn, Brooklyn's district attorney, I think 
this week or last week said that they want to liberate 20,000 um, offenders from cannabis, uh, cannabis offenders, um, which nice. is pretty good. But that's just scratching the surface, right? There's probably more than 20,000 people locked up in, in Brooklyn. Um, yeah. But, so, you know, a start. It's kind of like the bleeding edge of the Emancipation Proclamation. Like we're starting to see a little bit of justice, but not really. Yeah, I mean, it's just classic of the hypocrisy in this country. Right. Um, you, got, you, know, you, got, you got all these companies lining up to make Coca-Cola-infused, uh, cannabis-infused drinks and everything else, you know. While people are still yeah. locked up. Yeah, exactly. What um, – okay, so – Obviously, just hearing you, you're, you're coming from somewhere else, New Zealand, and you live in the States. Like, I, I constantly hear negative narratives about the U.S., but, you know, I, I keep looking around the globe, like, where I want to live, and I'm living in the Rockies, like, kind of for a lot of reasons. Um, but, like, what's your take on this? Like, I know the drug war is driven by the U.S. Is it just, like, the beating heart of a culture, or, like, what do you, how do you think about that? Well, America is the most unique country on the planet. In terms of it's 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 over it, it just I mean I've lived here for a long time and sometimes I think it's like living in the belly of the beast <laughs> but the only way the only the only way you can really get to understand it is to be a part of it you know and we have such dichotomies in this country from the situation we're talking about here in the south to you know Burning Man and things like that it like it goes from one extreme to the other. Um, There are so many forces at work in the United States. I mean, honestly, at this point, I kind of think it's too big. I actually think the best thing for the world would be if the United States broke up into a few smaller countries. I doubt that's ever going to happen. Yeah, it's, you know, as as to why I live here, I always say about New Orleans, it's not where you want to be, it's where I'll have you. (laughs) (laughs) That place is incredible. If people haven't been, it's like, I think it's my favorite um, American city, if not favorite city in the world, for sure. It's a great city to be an artist in. It's one of the last true bohemian communities that I've managed to find. So I've been here a long time now. So Yeah. And being in the South, it's warm and you probably won't freeze to death um, most of the time. Yeah, I, get, I get out for the summers. <laughs> <laughs> summers are tense. Um, so, okay. So medicalization, I think we covered that adequately maybe um i I hope folks bring questions so we can kind of follow up on that but um healthy individuals go ahead go ahead sorry i mean i just spent a weekend at a retreat in new york with roland griffith from john hopkins and we actually got along we actually bonded surprisingly well i thought um and i was very happy to hear that the john hopkins group will be investigating five methoxy dmt and I definitely think that this kind of data that John Hopkins and groups like this are generating, that's the kind of data we're going to need to fight the cognitive liberty side of things, the, the human right for any of us to take psychedelics. And it's going to start with the work of guys like Roland Griffith. So I fully support what's got you know much of the concepts of what's going on i just get a little bit i just wish it was just a part of what's going on with psychedelics not suddenly you know since poland's books come out and maps and everything else you've got this real it feels like a stampede in that direction right so but like I, at, at the same time i fully um you know I, I, the work that roland and charles grob and guys like those that do is is very important. I don't want to. I don't want to make. I don't want to demean it. So after after decades of doing this work, Stan Groff said he's just not interested in the research anymore because he felt like it was done already, and he was ex- <laughs> explicitly interested in the creativity research and the visionary uh-huh. art. Um, yeah. You know, from being yeah. he was good friends with H.R. Giger for a long time, and that was a huge influence in his life. Um, yeah, well, if you get to if you get to part three of my new book, it's the first actual history of the first history of visionary art. It's mm. really been a 10, a 200 page history of visionary art. That's one third of my new book. Yeah. Um, I'm, and I've been, I've been hanging with all the visionary artists for the last decade. So 
I've watched that evolve. So you, right. Like I think for Groff, it's like the creativity is what could help us survive this uh, sixth grade extinction. If anything, I don't, well, as, as Alex Gray likes to say, art could be the next religion. Right. Right. Which would be lovely. Like I <laughs> imagine if he was Pope, you know, he's only got a few skeletons in his closet, but I would way prefer him to the Vatican, you know? Yeah. I could handle Alex being in charge. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, I feel what I was going to say that. Yeah, it's, 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 um, you know, I think we're in an interesting time in history where all the, all the monoliths are collapsing, all the big structures are collapsing around us and we're getting down to an individualized view of almost everything. So I think as an individual, we have the right to almost create our own spirituality and our own religion and our own, you know, if we all go and find what we find and then we, we come together in clusters of like findings. That's the way for a healthy new spirituality to to grow. And I think visionary art is like the current is a new mythology that's being created for a new kind of, a new kind of spirituality. Yeah. That's reminded me of pinch back in 2009 when I was at horizons. He, he mentioned something about, cloistering up in small permaculture communities focused on individual sub aspects like this whatever really draws you if you want to do witchcraft cool if you want to do art cool like whatever you want to do and then we're not contributing to the problem anywhere close to as much as we are as being part of the mainstream and um i thought that was a really fascinating thing that helped me yeah gnostic communities exactly which has happened several times yeah i think daniel and i have pretty similar in our ideas about that. You know, Daniel used to have a much rosier view of things. It's a lot darker. And now, now he's, he's right. He's on my page. Um, <laughs> have you visited have Tamara, a... uh, the place in Portugal? No, he's told me a little bit about it. Sounds interesting. Right. That, you know, listeners check that out. It's a very interesting thing. Daniel's book, uh, how soon is now is worth checking out. Um, he, we did an interview with him, but it turned out terrible. But uh, so it, so if you want to listen to a terrible interview, you can check that out. Um, uh, hopefully, we dig in again. But uh, yeah, like this this idea of Gnosticism and digging deep and uh, reemergence of spirit, I think could really help because um, I don't I don't think we've really had an emergence of spirit the way we could in a few years if if things played out correctly, um, like in small cloisters, but. Now this thing is democratized. You don't need to spend 20 years meditating to get there. Yeah. I think I think Burning Man between 2000 and till the ticket crisis was definitely an experiment in community that has now become more of a theme park. Um, and I think that's the problem with this approach is as soon as you have any success, there's a lot of other things everybody wants a piece of it and they all, all that every tears it to pieces almost. Mm. So it's very difficult in this connected day and age to have small communities because as soon as they start getting anywhere, they kind of, they have a tendency to maybe get overrun. I don't know. I don't have any answers. I mean, <laughs> you, it sounds like you've that. got some questions though. Um, yeah. I, you know, I would say one of the big things that psychedelics has taught me as we occupy two realities, the outer reality, which we have no control of and the inner reality, which we do. And the more you can get your inner reality in in good shape, the better you'll be able to deal with the outer reality. And that's, you know, that's kind of where it's at. I mean, it's like Huxley said, after a lifetime of study, all he had to offer was people be a little nicer to each other. And it's really very true. You know, right, right. As psychedelics said below, has never been so psych- true. Exactly, and psychedelics are not a magic pill. They don't just—they're not a cure-all. They're not going to save us. But I do think the psychedelic perspective, which is the worldview that you end up taking on if you are a regular psychedelic user, is the perspective that the planet needs to survive. Now, whether as a society we can shift to that perspective quickly enough is highly debatable. 
but I do feel the tools are in hand. Mm. You know, I, and that might seem a little simplified, but there is something about taking some psychedelics that moves you into a much more holistic perspective in the world. And it happens to big time CEOs. It happens to everybody. You know, I've got a friend who works for Tesla. And he told me that we were, we're always having this argument about the Silicon Valley elite and Burning Man and backwards and forwards. And he told me the story that he got home from Burning Man one year and he got a call from this guy that he did business with that was a real hard ass. And they didn't even think really that they liked each other or anything. And he suddenly got this weird phone call where he wanted to come to lunch. So he went to have lunch with this guy and this guy had been to Burning Man, had some kind of an experience come back from Burning Man, realized he was an asshole and was trying to figure out how he could make his company more humanitarian and be better to his employees. Now, if Burning Man has that effect on Silicon Valley elite, great. You know, on everybody, on anybody. Not, you know, but at some point, and it's almost a size thing or I don't know, I mean – I feel there's less and less of that out there these days. Now, it just seems to be more and more of it. It's like a billionaire's pissing match. And they're all trying to outdo each other, and they've, they've missed the – they're not getting it, you know? Mm. So I can't tell if we're winning the battle or we're getting overwhelmed. <laughs> it's, I think it's always going to be a dynamic dance, and hopefully people find out about folks like you, Pinchback, and others, say, oh, maybe we should talk to these dudes and figure out what the hell's happening. Um, well, you, you look at something that was pretty – I mean, in the early 2000s, not many people really gave Burning Man much thought. Till, till a few years ago, you could just roll into Reno and buy a ticket and roll straight in from the head shop. As, you know, as soon as it, it – when it goes from something that is a hardcore of 20,000 to a, to a one-time population of 80,000 in 10, 15 years, that's a lot of – you can't – it's hard to bring everybody along at that pace, you know. So I've not gone, but I was really positive. Um, I attended a regional burn in Vermont um, out of the Boston crew, and that was nice. phenomenal. Very small, probably 500 or less people, probably more like 300 people. And it was incredible. And um, I see that regional burns are seeming to gain momentum because you know it's uh, substantially cheaper for people to go. Um, it, it just makes it more accessible and, and democratic. But it isn't a week, you know? It isn't seven days, well, typically. in a lot of ways, they're more authentic to the original experience. I'm actually going to the Louisiana burn this weekend Great. in golf. And I and that's 400 people. And I, and I think, in a lot of ways, that is more like what Burning Man was like late 90s, early 2000s, when you had a chance to know everybody. There was a real, very, very tight sense of community. So Burning guess, Man doesn't feel, to Brent, feel as much of a tight on. community anymore. Will you Will like you go to Burning city. Man again? Uh, yeah, I probably will. <laughs> so, I've, been like, so. I've been to like 17 or 18 now. Um, and I had a little bit of a rough year this year, like sometimes happens. So maybe I'm a little jaded. Um, you know, I go because and it's a very – I go partially because I feel like I have I, I'm needed there. If people like me stop going, then the place has less and less chance. I, and it's still the place where I meet the the most interesting people each year. You know, the the widest range of the most interesting people I generally meet at Burning Man or have met through Burning Man. But yeah, it's like when I, I mean. Yeah, I'll, I, will, I will imagine I will keep going. I'm not going to go for a year or two because next year I'm flying in the World Championships of paragliding in Macedonia in August. And then the year after that, I'm thinking about going back to Boom in Portugal. And it's hard to do Boom and Burning Man in the same year. That sounds like a big year if you do that, yeah. Yeah, I've done it. It's just a bit exhausting. Boom, right. kicks, my, boom kicks my ass. It's really hot. Do you? Is there anything about Boom you like more than Burning Man? I like the fact that Boom is in a country where everything's legal. You know, Portugal has decriminalized everything. Real so deal drug a, testing. Real, yeah, well, and that's it. And there's a, there is a very different vibe at Boom because of that fact, because there is no paranoia. 
at all. You're not you're not worried about undercovers. You don't have any of the. I don't find Burning Man a particularly free environment anymore. Burning Man now, you're pretty you're pretty. It used to like 15, 20 years ago, all of the camps were designed to be open, so people would you would attract people to come in and 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 meet you, and now they're all closed and circled up and. You know, we, we've definitely gone into more of a defensive posture there because of the reality of what you're dealing with. And once again, like the, I don't know how much you were following it this year, but the the road blockages on Indian land where they were shaking everybody down, I mean, that's some of the most unconstitutional shit I've ever heard of. And why? I just don't get why. Why are they so concerned about a bunch of people having a fancy party in the desert? I don't get it. It seems way out of proportion. The amount of, of the amount of authorities and police and different agencies that are there for the amount of trouble that if you look over the arrests over the last twenty years, they're pretty minimal. They're way less than at like a big football game or something like that. I just don't I don't understand how they can justify the amount of resources they put into policing something that doesn't produce a lot of serious crime. Yeah, I don't think it's about that. I think it's about trying to scare the culture and control the culture. But they perhaps don't understand that there's so many... Uh, like, if you look at Woodstock, almost probably everybody was poor. Now you have shitloads of these rich people going to party, and they can afford great lawyers. So, you know, federal government, watch out. Like, you're setting yourself up for a bad situation and a division of the people. Like, if you want a continuous country, you have to well, not divide of- the people. Go ahead. A lot of people were saying, oh, this is coming directly down from Trump and Jeff Sessions and everything else. And my point is, if Donald Trump and Jeff Sessions are discussing Burning Man, we're really fucked. Like, there's so many more important things they should be worrying about. The fact that that's even on the cultural radar astonishes me. There's a report the administration put out, you know, if that's true or not, who knows, but um, there is a report the Trump administration put out about climate change recently, and they agreed that it was in fact happening, but they said it's a done deal and we're not going to do anything about it. It's not our focus, which is interesting to me. Um, It's like, okay, now we're just going into the climate wars. It's like, great. (laughs) Perfect. Sure. I never heard. I didn't hear that one. Yeah. I'll try to dig up the link and uh, send it over. It's a, it's interesting that they just assumed it was um, irreversible not worth solving i guess they would rather just go to war and do the you know the billionaire bunker game as opposed to keeping a a pleasure pleasure planet going you know yeah the billionaire bunker game seems to be popular it's heating up man apparently they're buying it up in the buying up tons of land in the midwest uh for some reason and new zealand and new zealand that's right that's right i uh uh who is that dude they're Peter Thiel. Yeah, him. There's another gentleman coming from like a big aristocratic family, bought this enormous organic apple orchard um, maybe 10 years ago down there. And partly as, I think, uh, catastrophe arbitrage, something along those lines. Oh, yeah. Our awesome new female prime minister just banned sale of land to foreigners. (laughs) Outstanding. Cool. Yes. Yeah, well, Peter Thiel, you know, was one of Trump's biggest backers. He came down there and bought himself a passport somehow. And he's actually openly bragged that he believes he can buy his own country. And that he had a he had a price that he, he thought he could buy a whole country for. I think he thought New Zealand was up for sale. Yeah, luckily, right. New Ze- luckily, New Zealand seems to have pushed back. Yeah. You know, New Zealand's got a... It seems like a smiley country. Everything's good. But there's, you know, a fair amount of... Uh conservatism there and guns and, oh yeah, it's, yeah it's, it's, it's 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 pretty conservative yeah but at the same time it's only four million of us mm-hmm. so you imagine you imagine any community of four million up against pressure from like you know that's not very many much pushback right so what um regarding psychedelics like what what are you most excited about right now like have you seen anything in the last year or two that's been um, most exciting? Hmm. That's an interesting question. Um, I mean, it's exciting to watch 
psychedelic closet, uh, culture coming out of the out of the closet, I, I, it's both exciting and frightening. I think to see this this mainstreaming that's going on. Um, so I'm I'm an, a very interested observer. I would say these 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 days. Mm. Yeah, it's um, yeah, the way you phrased it right there is interesting. I'm I'm. <sighs> On one hand, I'm wondering if the medicalization is a deliberate effort to defang or take power away from the psychedelic culture. And it sounds like kind of that's what you're saying. Um, but I'm wondering if it's deliberate or not. I think I think the medicalization is just more like anything. People smell financial opportunities here. Mm -hmm. You know? Um, do I keep going back to cannabis? I saw recently that one... one uh, Pharmaceutical company is about to release a CBD based uh, medicine that's going to cost thirty two thousand dollars. <laughs> right. You know, this is where we're heading. Yeah, you know. So it's not. Uh, you know, and I like uh, the MDMA thing, which is really MDMA, which is really not a true psychedelic in a lot of people's opinions, is very much leading this push towards legalization and I applaud Rick Donald and the work that MAPS has done but there's also a potential dark side to that the fact that the US military is so interested in it partially is because they have an enormous problem on their hands with PTSD with returning servicemen but there's also I mean there's this ideas like drone operators for example that, that are now becoming very important in warfare suffer from depression when they realize what they've, you know, that they're bombing people that they never see and everything else. So who's to say that MDMA and these things are not going to be used to keep these guys at their desks? There's definitely a potential dark side to this that as we tend to always look on the positive side, but there is always a dark side. And there's also the fact that psychedelics and have been, you know, psychedelics got released into our, counterculture largely by the US government in the start there's a very convoluted history of government involvement in psychedelics and I, I, I still am very much of the opinion that the wave of acid in the 60s was designed to politicize the universities you know it's, it's viewed by our culture as something that escaped and created this great freedom but what it did do was it depoliticized the left very effectively, and that left has never really re, has never really re, regrouped. You know, mm. so there's a dark side to that too. Right, right, right. Like um... Mike Petsky and Co. They're not doing psychedelic, right? <laughs> <laughs> Until they find out how pleasurable it is, and then maybe um, no, I because hope. they're power they're power freaks. Mm. You know, That's a good Jesus. point. It necessitates letting go quite a bit. Yeah. Um, That's not what they're interested in. Mm. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, I, I do want to develop a course on that whole dark history that it's really, like you say, extremely convoluted. Have you have you uh, bumped into Robert Forte? I was about to say, Robert Forte is the guy to talk to about that. Right. I had him on the show and it was like a... Uh, mental wrestling match with myself like do I publish this thing or not and we ended up doing <laughs> it and it was our most popular episode in a long time um, yeah, I, I think I actually listened to some of that yeah it was really fun um, it was scary because I'm like he's really going after Rick and he's really going after you know the US government I'm like ah, I don't necessarily believe everything he says but I, I do believe he believes it and there's historical evidence for a good portion of it um, well Robert's an interesting Robert's an interesting character because he's definitely got the credentials. He was in, he's been a big part of the psychedelic movement, and for he's, a long time. he's for a long time, and and he's he's come around to a darker view of it. He tends to be a bit of a conspiracy theorist about everything, which to me sort of makes it a little tricky when everything becomes a conspiracy theory. But I have an, I have a incredible respect for the man's intellect. Absolutely, yeah. He he came off to me like probably a little too smart for his own good and uh you know he, i think he probably would agree with that a little bit too like uh, <laughs> shot myself in the foot a few times i think he said that to me once 
Um, but yeah, it's it's fascinating, and I think under understudied, like the fact that people don't understand that MK Ultra did happen, and Artichoke did happen, and um, the FBI was actively working against the Black Panthers and all this stuff um, that was happening in the states and, and internationally, drugs as weapons. The race, the recent thing where the Turns out the village in France may have been dosed by the CIA in the fifties. Yeah, I thought that was pretty well established, but uh, that's nuts that that did happen. It seems like warfare, an act of war. Uh, Yeah, obviously the French government agreed to it. Robert believes that Albert Hoffman was directly in charge. Oh my god! You know, so the last and that was put down to being the last known case of ergotamine poisoning. You know. Mm. But I think I think most people who are scholars of psychedelics are well aware of that part of the history. Um, Poland touched on it a little bit. Yeah, you know, a little. Robert and I always get into it about about Larry because I think that Larry was playing both sides of the fence, and Robert very much sees Tim as a bit of a saint. But I mean. Timothy Leary had had a, had a mental breakdown and was in Spain and his career was in tatters and suddenly he gets dropped at Harvard with tenure. And the guy who was in charge of the philosophy department at Harvard started the OAS. So the connections are there. What was the LAS? The OAS, which was the, the organization pre-CIA. The, oh, right, that on, started, right on, right on, right yeah, on. Office of Strategic Services, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, yes, Harvard's been very of, implicated in a lot of this dark history and good history. Um, well, I think you you know we you have to remember what this political uh, climate was like in the late fifties and early sixties. The CIA wasn't viewed as darkly as it is now, I think. And both in England and America, the secret services used those schools to recruit Cambridge and Oxford in England and and you know Harvard and Princeton and that in the states. So. They were looking for the best and the brightest, and they often convinced these guys that they were saving the world. You know, as John Perry Barlow used to say, uh, "CIA, they never get it right." <laughs> no, no, they always that bone was, it up. That uh, was Barlow's take. <laughs> if you look at the history, it's a long series of screw ups, and uh, it's pretty nuts. It, probably the successes are what's kept secret, but there's a lot of this. Uh, stuff has just blown up in a bad way. We've never actually talked about JP Barlow on the show. Um, were you, were you oh, buddies really? with him? A little bit. Yeah. I knew yeah. Barlow. Um, Barlow was a character. Right. He just passed this sorely, year, right? Sorely missed. Yes. Yeah. Um, he, how do you really frame him? He's a figure people in this world should know. Um, well, Barlow is an interesting character because he was another one that could, could walk in multiple multiple worlds. I mean, obviously he's best known in psychedelic culture for being the, uh, one of the songwriters for the Grateful Dead. I think he was Phil Lesh's, um, roommate at, at high school or something. That's how they all got together. Um, but the guy, he also, you know, helped start Wired magazine and, and was the electronic freedom foundation. And there's an interesting, you know, he's a, he's an interesting case of the crossovers between, Silicon Valley and the psychedelic culture, and he was kind of a bit of a bit of a godfather to both of them. Really, mm-hmm. Barlow was a great Barlow was a great connector. He was good at putting people together. That's what I saw. Right, co-founder of EFF Electronic Freedom Foundation. It's a really important group. Um, yeah. well, he and he and he and. Uh, John Gilmore, the other co-founder, who's also a big maps guy, they took the U.S. government, they had the highest civil suit against the U.S. government ever. For the, They're the ones that broke open the phone tapping for the cell phone company. So they, they walked the walk. You know, they walked the walk. And I wish there was more of us. That's the problem with, with psychedelics sometimes is it depoliticizes people. And I would like to see it politicize people more often and be like, Barlow and and uh, and John and, and be out there doing good work that seems to have some you know psychedelics give you a different different paradigm to operate in I think or a different view.
but you need to integrate them into everything else. People that just get into psychedelics, you know, it's just like if you're just into Jesus, you know, if you you need to, you got to integrate it. And that's the big thing I talk about in my talks a lot is the need for integration. And if you have a really powerful psychedelic experience, take a step back, you know, give yourself some time. Or as Terence said, go to the library. Don't just go to the go to another ayahuasca circle and go looking for that again because people don't integrate the experience. They just go, they get hooked on the experience. Mm-hmm. And I think we're seeing, I think we're seeing that with a lot of these toad shamans. Ooh. Let's not go there. Let's not go there. <laughs> right. We can hit that in the future. Um, so yeah, toad shamans, watch out. We're coming. <laughs> so I I think there's something important there about integration and when i hear most people talk about integration i'm not sure they understand but at, i think at the basic level going to the library is a great step like that's probably one of the better simple explanations i've heard um, that was terence's classic quote if you the first place you go after a major psychedelic experience is the library it's cool right because you're curious you're kind of more childlike and you go, oh maybe i do want to learn about flying or plants or whatever well, I- I always call 5-MeO DMT as the greatest intellectual adventure of my life. Mm. Because it entirely reshaped my view of reality, my, my understanding of science, so many things. Like it really uh, intellectually shifted me dramatically. And I'm eternally grateful for that change in perspective. Uh, quantum physics, for example, I'd always had a really hard time trying to grasp after 5-MeO-DMT, it was one of the few things that made sense. You know, so it's interesting that an experience like that can actually help you change the way you conceptualize things as well. And all reality is is a series of conceptualizations. Mm. Mm-hmm. You know? Mm. I mean, for a long time, I thought about the fact that 5-MeO, I always went back to the same place. I pretty much end up in the same spot, same if, if things happen. And uh, Alexander Shulgin and his scale, the plus four, is a once in a lifetime unrepeatable event. So I was like, well, how can this be my plus four? Because I keep having the same experience every time. But then I realized, oh, well, everything only really changed once after the first time. Now it's just putting, just, you know, it's like a, uh, puts me back on the path. Mm-hmm. But the actual, the major change happened the first time. You can't have your paradigm shift every single time you smoke 5 methoxy DMT. But if it shifts once in your life, that's major, you know. And for me, it was a major intellectual adventure. I think I have a much more sophisticated view of reality than I did beforehand. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think and I'm much, more, I'm much more interested. How many times do you think you've smoked five? Have, do you keep track? Not really. No. I'm sort of on once every year, every two years now. Mm-hmm. For a while, I did it a lot, and then it just got too more power, too powerful. Right. Which I appreciate the fact that it's so powerful that I can't do it all the time, or I don't want to do it all the time. My hand still shakes when I pick up the pipe because I know right. what's going to happen. I know what's going to happen to me now, mm-hmm. and it's you know a lot of my work. Over the last decade, it's been trying to integrate some of Eckhart Tolle's ideas on the ego to a psychedelic perspective. And there's a classic, Tolle says the ego is constantly trying to convince you it's reformed and it doesn't need any more work. It's all good now. And I always laugh when people become shamans after two or three experiences and suddenly they want to evangelize and take the ayahuasca or the toad or whatever. That's their ego convincing them that it's all good now. Right? And so I no- I notice the longer I go between smoking, the harder it gets. And the more my ego gets reinforced, and it's like, well, you don't really need to destroy me, you know? And it's funny. And then you finally do it, and you're like, oh, my God, why don't I do this more often? Because mm-hmm. it's so because it's so liberating. And I think there's a real – there's something going on there, the fact that, that this is part of the process, this destruction of the ego and – shamanic birth and rebirth and it, it gives you a, a, a it's like hitting the reset button but if you do it every day it loses its effectiveness mm. you know like anything 
Yeah. I think the fact, I think the fact that Five Mirror DMT is so powerful is part of what gives me such tremendous respect for it. If it was something I could just do whenever I wanted, I doubt I would still feel the respect for it that I do after 15 years. Right. And what I see, what I see in the, those people that a lot of the, the facilitators like to tail, some facilitators like to tail end it and do a little hit on the end of everybody else's hit. And I think that's a very dangerous habit because I think that is, if anything, is calcifying you to the experience and you become convinced that you're in control of that experience, which really you're not. But that's just my take. I would love to see people take um, cult psychology more seriously and understand what's happened in the past and what's happening now because there's so much BS going on. And um, I think like you've said in other interviews, like let's try to take this scientifically and empirically and not jump to crazy conclusions here. Um, psychedelic, if you've studied psychedelic history, you see it repeating itself. All over. Tim Leary and Ken Kesey and all these guys have already walked this path. They've already they've already shown us the pitfalls. And it's interesting that the five MEO DMT community they they get together and we have all these things about ethics and this, that, and the other. And I'm always like, you guys are trying to reinvent the wheel. This has all been going on for fifty years. You just don't pay any attention to psychedelic history and you now feel that five MEO is different to what LSD was in the 60s or whatever, but really it's the same cyclical patterns go around and around and around over and over again, which I find fascinating that people aren't more historically interested. That's unfortunate, yes. You will always repeat those mistakes, people. It's <laughs> never been more yeah. true. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely true. Like, is LSD really considered not powerful anymore? Are you serious, people? Come on. I understand five is very powerful. Well, the reason LSD is now considered not powerful is because we've dialed it down. Very few people take the kind of doses they took in the 60s. True. Right? And now they go to the jungle to do ayahuasca to get that experience because they want the shaman and they want the whole set and setting to make them feel like they're doing something more valid than if they took 600 mics of LSD. To me, they're pretty much the same lesson, you know. But a lot of people get caught up in the, the set and setting and this idea that the shaman's guiding them or protecting them. Or, and there is, there is something to be said for that. But we had the opportunity to develop all those protocols ourselves over the last – and this is where I get a big argument with a lot of the toad facilitators these days where everyone's like, oh – You've got to smoke it with a facilitator and it's so dangerous. You have to be with somebody. And most facilitators are not trained. They've just got access to it from wherever and they believe they've trained because they've been. And that's what I say is we should really have, you know, every community should have its own psychonautic uh, ways of doing things. If you're, if you're in a community that's used psychedelics for a long time, you have elders, you've developed these pro protocols, you've done it with your friends. People that want to start, people that are interested in doing 5 meo DMT, I'm like, what else have you done? You know, I had somebody was asking me recently, he wanted to do psychedelics with his son. His son was a teenager and he was, he was like, well, we'll do it. I, I figured we'd do DMT. I was like, no, start with mushrooms and go for a walk in the, in the woods and see how that goes. There's no need to jump to the top of the stack. But there's a – and you saw Michael Pollan do exactly that. He was nowhere near ready for Toad in any shape or form. And I was surprised that someone gave it to him. But, you know. <sighs> um, yeah, I've, I've heard rumors of who it is, but we won't name any names. But I, 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 could, tell, I could tell who it was from <laughs> – from from his description, right, right. I at least he at least he was in good hands. True, my um, <laughs> my uh, <laughs> my own personal path is interesting in that I did a, a shitload of holotropic breath work before ever touching psychedelics. Like I tried mushrooms, but for whatever reason, I didn't launch. I jumped right to ayahuasca, which was you know 
I think I was very ready for it after seven years of breath work experience, but um, it, that's not the path people typically go for, right? They just jump right in. I think might as well go to Peru. Well, these days you do get a lot of people going straight to ayahuasca that, mm-hmm. because they're outside of psychedelic culture. There's, you know, ayahuasca is now invaded yoga culture and women's magazines, and there's all kinds of people. And Toad is the next one that people are starting to think is some answer to their sad lives. You know, I don't. I think these are being mis miscategorized. There's, and you see so many of these ayahuasca retreats. Like if ayahuasca retreats were a little bit more honest, if they're like, "Hey, you want to come to Peru and get really high?" You know, this is what we're going to do. But they're all they're all framed in all this gibberish about healing and trauma and rah rah. And some of it's true, some of it's not. Most people that go to Peru to do ayahuasca just want to get high. And that's another whole conversation is about how much DMT has traditionally been in ayahuasca, and whether or not in the last twenty years that has increased greatly because of ayahuasca tourism. In my belief. Most ayahuasca cultures were not particularly psychedelic unless you happen to be very sensitive. And now, but since since the interest in the Europe with well, the Westerners and the the whole economy of ayahuasca, which is massive in a country like Peru, they now dial it up. There's way more chacruda, way more DMT in the brew than there ever used to be. The guy that makes the brew that everybody loves in Iquitos is an American. You know, it's just recognizing what you're using it for. Mm. And, you know, being aware of these debates, like, I think you're totally correct. Um, Traditionally, I don't even think the uh, sick people in the village would really drink too often. Um, The shaman would drink it and do the work, which is, you know, weird, but it's just the way the shamanic culture would work. Well, I think the way it worked initially was he would give you a pretty small dose to try and get almost hope, just to get your energy fields in resonance, so then he could actually link in with your energy fields. It's kind of the idea. Um, and then it, it became more and more of the patient drinking more. Yeah, it's a complicated subject. Right, right, I, right. It really annoys me when I hear people call drugs medicine, like psychedelic medicines out of context. And you hear it more and more. You hear it in festival settings. Oh, let's do some medicine. That's not medicine. You go dancing. You know, I'm, I'm a writer, so language, I think language is powerful in the way that we pervert our language. You know, everybody's calling toad medicine. I don't call toad medicine. It's a sacrament of some kind. I don't know anybody that's been cured of anything from smoking toad. You know, it certainly doesn't – it's not a medicine in the traditional Western sense of the word. I said it should be called therapy, if anything. Right, right, right. I – yeah. Toad, <laughs> for listeners, don't do toad. <laughs> that's, my, <laughs> that's my number one conclusion here. Um, you know, spend your time figuring out how to get the synthetic stuff and leave these poor animals alone so they don't go extinct. Um, more on that later. Yeah, maybe we should explain that in a little more in depth. You know, 5 methoxy right. tea originally appeared in its synthetic form through the research chemicals companies in the 90s. Very few people knew anything about it. I got it accidentally because I was looking for DMT. Then when I read up about what little of it was on it, I realized it was very different to DMT. Yeah, right. I had a complete mystical experience the first time I smoked it, which completely caught me by surprise. I wasn't looking for God. I wasn't expecting God. I had no, I actually had never come across anything in the literature that said anybody could have that happen. All the literature at that point was super negative. And it was mostly people just having seizures and whiteouts and things like that. There was really nothing in the literature that gave me any idea that I might have the experience that I had. So now since the interest in 5-methoxy DMT grew, and then I was my book was the first one that really pointed out the, the fact that it was in the bufo or various toad venom. And now, unfortunately, the supply of synthetic 5-MeO-DMT has pretty much disappeared, forcing people that are interested in it to go the route of the toad, where you have some Mexican toad shamans traveling the world with their wares, 
you know, expensively, and not only Mexicans. Uh, and more frighteningly, we've got some guy in Mexico who will post it to you, three hundred dollars a gram. He's like cold contacting people on the on the internet, going, "Do you want me to send you some toad?" So I think that's why we have a outbreak of toad shamans all over the place now. So be very careful if you do smoke toad, who you're smoking it with for a start. Right. I honestly think if the synthetic was readily available, we wouldn't have the problem. I actually think the breakthrough is going to come when we find a plant source that we can extract it as easily as we can extract DMT from a Mosa Hostilis, and then anybody with a any basic chemistry background and a couple of mason jars can make their own. Right, 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 right. I would say <laughs> I'm excited for um, ke- people with chemistry background to see that synthetic 5-MeO is not that hard to synthesize and they could be making a killing off of it on the dark market. And um, I don't really understand why there's none around. Right. There's no, there's no actual reason. It's, it's a, it's a matter of um, creativity and diligence and business sense. Like if you're, if you're that person, you know, look into this, you, you are doing the environment a favor. <laughs> um, like these, but it's like we were, we were talking about the Czech Republic, which has a lot of, psychedelic research and things going on and it seems like they're mostly smoking toad over there like why is there no chemist there that's me right exactly um the culture hasn't had the shift and they have that kind of shamanic ideology religious ideology around this like uh, fictitious history well this is what's happened now there's another whole there's another whole mythology growing around this toad venom that's completely inaccurate and it's really the cult of the personality Mm -hmm. and so I, I, people might not understand ecology too well, but I'll uh, lay a really quick thing on these toads are coming from a s- really um, too highly populated desert in southern Arizona, northern Mexico, right around uh, Sea of Cortez. And it's, uh, you know, we're getting a ton of environmental impact from climate change and overdevelopment, uh, lights and cars. So there's a lot of things killing these toads and harvesting these toads in a, desert ecosystem that takes a long time to grow and regenerate um, is really, you know, uh, added pressure on this species, particularly that the other species don't have to deal with. And and we're just seeing total species decline in these deserts anyway. So be aware that you're, it's pretty much like going after black rhino horn. Let's smoke some black rhino, you know, like, come on. (laughs) People should kind of, you know, get it and kind of grow up a little bit around this and, realize you're you're putting a species at extreme risk for extinction and let's pump the brakes for a couple of years or t- a decade figure this shit out well part of the problem is people are interested and they really want to try the experience and mm-hmm. after reading books that people buy me i can understand that so it's a bit of a it's a bit of a catch 22 we've right. done it and now we're telling everybody else to wait mm-hmm. so i think hamilton's I think gonna we'll, redo his episode on on the toad and kind of hopefully correct some of his errors. And I think Vice kind of made some cuts on it um, that that were not what Hamilton wanted to, just for ratings, you know. So well, for start, for start, that wasn't El Most. Yeah, I and think he ha- knows ha- that now. Hamilton knows that now. Yeah. Um. Cool. So we've been going for a little over an hour. What do you would you like to maybe close with anything or fit complete what you're thinking there? Yeah, I mean, I do think the 5-methoxy-DMT experience is utterly unique. It doesn't. It should barely be considered a psychedelic. It doesn't really act or work like a classic psychedelic. It's an entirely different experience. It's not for everybody. It can have serious psychological after effects, which is probably my main concern, is that a lot of people these days that maybe are not prepared for it are rushing into it, and there is a possibility in a very small proportion of people that you can have negative side effects that can last for years. The most famous case being Robert Augustus Masters, who wrote a book called Darkness Shining Wild, which is the story of his total breakdown on 5MEO and the years it took him to rebuild himself. He's gotten a lot of attention recently for a book on spiritual bypassing that he wrote. So I would, I would start with a warning, and I would just say if you're interested in psychedelic culture and you're new to it, start with the classics. Start with, 
mushrooms, start with LSD, you know, do it with your friends, do it for breakfast, do it outside. You know, like there's, there's, there is a, there's a new model of psychedelic exploration that's emerging that I think takes everything a little too quick. Michael Pollan's a classic example of like jumping from one to the next to the next without really ever getting to know any of them, you know, and, um, there's as much validity on a mushroom trip walking in the in the forest as there is on a high dose DMT trip or ibogaine or whatever. They all they all have lessons to teach us, and start slow. There's a there's a there's a whole lifetime of discovery out ahead of you. Yeah, your life is a process, and there's plenty of time for the most part. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, you know, it, yeah. It, it it the way you're framing it seems to address the alienation a lot of us see in our in our day to day. Not doing it with our friends, um, a lot of issues like that. Like only do it with an expert that you kind of barely know. Like that. That's I, not I, valid. I dis I I disagree with that model. Mm. You know, and, and that's that's a model that's a model that almost implies that there's something wrong with you to start with. You know. And because that's not the model that I was introduced to it as, uh, it's this: if if people start to think that psychedelics are medicines, then the, then it increases the the idea that there's something wrong. You know, it just seems like a negative, seems like a negative connotation to something to me that is a very positive thing. Right. I love Groff's title, like the adventure of self discovery, and it's it's really mostly about you and your relationship with yourself and the world, and not so much about everything else that kind of gets pushed on you. I was going to say most people, you know, might be familiar with Stan's more scholarly works, but if you get a chance, read his autobiography when the impossible happens, because that is a he's great a wild man. life. He's a wild man. He's a scientist and it's a great life story of psychedelics weaved through a man's long and interesting life. And that's what we should all hope for. Yeah. It's, um, Quick bit of trivia on that. His house burnt down. He lost all his papers. And that was that was the next book he could write because he lost everything. So he's like, why not just write about my life? Because I don't have my documentation from my decades of research anymore. Um, wow. So, so Terrence lost two libraries. Jonathan Ott's library burnt down and Stan's burnt down. I better put, a pattern. I better put some more fire alarms in my library. <laughs> 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 yeah, just back it up in the cloud too somehow. <laughs> um, so that collapses. <laughs> so um, where? Yeah, right. Where can people find you online? And and uh, what's what's the name of your new, latest book? Also, the new book's called The New Psychedelic Revolution. Uh, it's pretty available at bookstores or Amazon. Uh, you can find me online, uh, Facebook, James O Rock. And there's a tryptamine palace page and I am actually moving towards setting up my own platform with a blog and some podcasts and things, but that's slow going. So I hope to have James, James up by the end of the year. Outstanding. All right, James. Well, thank you for joining us and uh, hope we get to have you on again in the future. Thank you very much for having me. And there you have it, James Orock, everybody. I hope you enjoyed it. He was a great guest and had a wonderful time interviewing him. And uh, hopefully someday I can compete against him in paragliding. But, uh, you know, perhaps he'll be retired and uh, maybe we'll both be in wheelchairs by the time I'm that uh, ready. But hope you enjoyed it. Learned a lot um, on my side. And uh, hopefully this 5-MEO DMT subject is it becoming a little more clear we're working on a class right now um about this sub subject and and hopefully we can figure out how to reduce harms globally on this I, I know there's organizations working to reduce harms it's just a matter of uh you know are they are they unbiased enough i, I hope that's the case um but uh, i'm not sure and you know you can check them out terra incognita i know rack rasm is working on that and I know he he's trying his best to be ethically sound, um, but you know perhaps we need to staff that organization with uh, both um, 
people religiously inclined towards the toad and people who are independent with no opinion. Yeah, perhaps that's it for now. Definitely check out James's new book, The New Psychedelic Revolution. I think you're going to love it. Yeah, that's about it. If you want to support the show, please let your friends know about it and leave us a review on iTunes or Facebook. It just takes a minute. And um, if you want to keep in touch, we've got uh, social media profiles on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And, you know, maybe more coming soon. I don't know, though. You and your friends do owe it to yourselves to become educated on psychedelic material. There's a lot of dangerous stuff happening out there in the drug world. And if you are an underground user, you really need to understand what's happening out there. There are fentanyl samples showing up in plenty of street drugs that they shouldn't be. Um, People are dying from fentanyl overdoses at unprecedented rates. And there are cheap and easy ways to protect yourself, like fentanyl test strips from DanceSafe that are available for a dollar or two from their site. Uh, Hopefully we can sell them soon as well. You can also take our class, Navigating Psychedelics, to better understand how to keep you, yourself, and your friends safe from various risks associated with psychedelic use. And this is a great package that we put together that really should help you understand the psychedelic uh, preparation, experience, and landing uh, or integration phase. And uh, it's packaged with tons of master classes as well. You might have heard all those names in the beginning. So check it out, Navigating Psychedelics. You can find it at psychedelicstoday.teachable.com or right from psychedelicstoday.com. Thank you all for listening to this episode. And this is Joe Moore with Psychedelics Today from Breckenridge, Colorado, signing off.